My mother had an insatiable curiosity about current events, history, and people. And if she were here tonight, she would be in the front row taking notes. She'd be the first one to raise her hand to ask the slightly provocative but remarkably insightful and relevant question. And we all wish she were here tonight to enjoy this evening's guest speaker. From its award-winning author event series to its extensive collection of government publications dating back to the 16th century, the Free Library is dedicated to advancing literacy, guiding learning, and inspiring curiosity through thought-provoking programs and life-changing resources. Many of the library's most beloved programs and services are made possible only with the help of private support. Please make a gift of whatever amount you're able to help the Free Library transform lives. You can do so online at freelibrary.org slash support. It's now truly my great pleasure to introduce the remarkable former U.S. Representative from Massachusetts, Barney Frank. Representative Frank was an outspoken Democratic member of our Congress from 1981 to 2013, during which time he made a name for himself as, quote, one of the most powerful and controversial members of the House of Representatives, according to the Washington Post. He served as the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee and co-sponsored the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act, which was one of the most significant reforms of the U.S. financial industry since the Great Depression. And on a more personal note, he was the first member of Congress to marry someone of the same sex while in office. In his new mem <laughs> I don't know if people usually get applause for getting married, but <laughs> still a wonderful achievement um, in many ways. In his new memoir, Frank, A Life in Politics from the Great Society to Same-Sex Marriage, he discussed his prodigious congressional career, personal struggles and successes, and a roadmap for meaningful political change. He'll be interviewed tonight by Dick Pullman, writer in residence at the University of Pennsylvania and national political columnist at WHYY's newsworks.org. It's wonderful to have them here with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming Barney Frank and Dick Pullman to the free library. Welcome, everybody. Oh, it is working. Great. Um, uh, uh, thanks to the Free Library for, uh, for having us here, and thanks for having me back as well. Um, we're going to talk, uh, some of you know the format, uh, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes here, back and forth, uh, uh, and then open it up to questions for the uh, second half hour. So uh, if you uh, think of great things, uh, hoard them. Uh, there will be people walking around with microphones, so uh, wait for the mic uh, when we uh, get to you. Um, I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about the book, uh, since that's why we're here, um, which I read uh, a lot of this weekend. What struck me more than anything was that you mentioned that there have been uh, uh, several, this is your term, seismic shifts in American life in the time that you were in public service uh, spanning 50 years, right, or more. Um, and interesting seismic shifts, one going one direction, one going the other. Uh, one, which was uh, remarkable, going sort of, I guess you'd say, upwards, was acceptance of uh, gay people in mainstream American life. Uh, and the other, uh, pointing downward, was a decline in faith in government. And, uh, you know, obviously not necessarily connected, but an amazing um, confluence, I suppose. Uh, I want to talk about the, the, the government one in just a second, but uh, in terms of the acceptance of gay, um, gay people in, in, in mainstream, and here we are, of course, we're in a state where we now have gay marriage is legal, uh, so that's obviously a, a, a striking. You mentioned in the book, and I'm just going to quote something here that you said, um, and this was during the um, Clinton impeachment period where you were defending the president, and you observed in the book uh, that homophobia had diminished to the point where an openly gay man uh, would become uh, one of the most effective defenders of a president accused of heterosexual misdeeds. <laughs> uh, so actually I have a two-part question. I guess one is that uh, given when you started your public service career in the 60s, could you have ever have imagined that we've gotten to the point where we are today 
No. Uh, I have a two-part question, but that's the first part. Right. <laughs> no, and in fact, even as we began to make progress, starting in the post stonewall period, at any time during the period up until 2012 when I retired, while I saw progress, I would have been too pessimistic. The pace of this has just continually uh, gone, gone faster and faster, you know, culminating, as I said, with uh, you know, the, the notion that I could marry the man I love as a sitting member of Congress um, would have been just unthinkable, not only in 1968, but in, in, in 2000, 2005. And I, 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 someone said, did you think that you could marry a guy and it, it wouldn't be controversial? And I said, well, actually, uh, it was very controversial. A number of my colleagues were very angry that I didn't invite them. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, it was beyond anybody's uh, notion. All right, so, so what, is, what has changed? What is, I mean, it's obviously not more than one cause, but what has, in your mind, been the main driving forces behind this fundamental change in the cultural paradigm? That, that's, that's easy, it's very clear. The decision by millions of us to be honest about who we are. Our reality has defeated the prejudice. The prejudice was literally ignorant, was based on stereotypes, and the, the, the being honest about who we were, it's called coming out. As you know, a little bit of an aside, um, sometimes people say, well, what do you have to talk about being gay so much? That diminished, but we used to hear that. And uh, uh, I would say, well, you know, we, we do not talk about our sexuality. We really don't discuss our sexuality any more than straight people do. But the difference is when straight people discuss their sexuality, it's called talking. <laughs> when, when, when we do it, it's called coming out. But the coming out process had two effects. First of all, it destroyed the stereotype. We weren't some, the men, the women, we were just like everybody else. And, you know, it's kind of hard to maintain the validity of a prejudice when you didn't know you were supposed to apply it in a particular case. I mean, how bad could we be? You didn't even know you were supposed to hate us till we told you. <laughs> Secondly, there was this network. And it's one reason why I believe we have, unfortunately, made more progress in LGBT areas than in race. I say, unfortunately, I wish we'd made more progress in race. But most African-American people don't have white relatives. And, and, and you know, all gay and lesbian people have straight relatives, or almost all. And, and that was people suddenly, well, that's my brother. That's my teammate. That's my doctor. Oh, yeah, I know her. She's, you know, uh, went to school with my sister. So that was basically it. It was just the, 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 our, our presence without hiding. And so one of the things I didn't know about, actually, that I read, and there's a lot of great stuff in the book that, um, uh, great stuff that you know, can easily just be ignored, you just pass through history and you never think about. One of them was uh, how there used to be a uh, executive order, I think it was signed by Del uh, President Eisenhower, Eisenhower. right, uh, which basically, um, you can explain it better than me, that basically it barred uh, gay people from uh, getting security clearances to work in government. Not just and, in government. Right, and this went on, and this was not overturned until, I guess you were, uh, you, you could tell people how you work with Clinton on this, uh, not until the 1990s. So it was in effect for like all those 40 41 years. 41 years. Yeah. Through the presidencies of John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Jimmy Carter. During the uh, McCarthy era, uh, there was a double barreled attack on communists and homosexuals. And, um, uh, I had in my office a guy who worked for me, gave me a copy of a Senate report in 1950 when the Senate was controlled by the Democrats. And the title page is The Employment of Homosexuals and Other Perverts in the Federal Government. And what's interesting was, and Eisenhower, Truman was a little resistant to that, but Eisenhower in 54 signed an official executive order that said if you were a homosexual, you automatically were denied a security clearance. And it wasn't simply because of blackmail. Because if it was because of blackmail, you resolved that if you were out. But being out didn't help you. It was that we were morally rotten, inferior. And it is, you're right, working in government, but not just in government. If you were working for an architectural firm or an engineering firm that had a contract with the State Department or the Defense Department, you went through this. And so when I first got to Congress, I would get calls from very worried, frightened, gay or lesbian people uh, who were working for various private companies and who were about to have their lives uh, examined and maybe they'd have to quit or the company w w would fire them because they couldn't work on it. And it, uh, finally, in, in 1993, 
when Bill Clinton tried, and he legitimately, sincerely tried to get rid of the ban on gays in the military and was frustrated by the opposition, including from Sam Nunn. Um, as I said in the book, I, I was working with him, and I said, well, people are very angry, and I think unfairly to you, but you can do, what you ought to do then is do some pro-gay things that Congress can't stop. So he issued the, he, he changed the executive order. He said no longer is there a problem with gay people getting security clearance. He also uh, created a new category for people who could get refugee status, people who are being persecuted in another country because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And he, he reinforced the notion that you shouldn't discriminate in the hiring. But that was, and that one, unlike some others, was enforced. People really were very frightened when they were uh, uh, working for some company and all of a sudden uh, the FBI would be going around and asking everybody about you. I mean, it's a pity. I don't know how many people here watch the Big Bang Theory, but there's one, uh, one, one episode where um, somebody needs a security clearance and they go and ask all his friends. They screwed up and he doesn't get it. But um, yeah, it was a very intrusive process and, and Clinton it lasted 41 years. You know, it was um, one of the things I noted in the book. We were talking about how this was a period in the book where you're talking about how in the 80s you were, you were sort of moving slowly toward the notion of coming out. Uh, and th this was a line in the book that I actually wrote down here. You said, I was tired of having to de-sex my pronouns uh, <laughs> ration, and ration my visits to places that I wanted to be. Yeah, it's like, oh, uh, you, you, yeah, you didn't want to lie. So you didn't want to say he and tell the truth. You don't want to say she and lie. At least that was my my policy has always been that uh, you should never lie. Um, you don't always have to volunteer the truth. I mean, it's it's the truth and nothing but the truth. And if they want the whole truth, sometimes they have to get a subpoena. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that's where we are in our daily lives. Most of you, if something happens that's going to make your spouse unhappy or somebody else close to you, and they're never going to find out, you probably don't volunteer it. And uh, that's the way, but um, uh, so you would have to kind of get to the passive voice and, uh, and, and, and it just really was a serious, you had to stop and think how you didn't give yourself away or, or claim to be straight when you weren't. Um, are, are you glad that uh, there was no Twitter and YouTube and uh, Snapchat and all oh, that Oh yeah, no question. It would you have been able to let that, hang on that long, you know, uh, in the closet, as it were, if, if, if with all that instant. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the price of being in the closet would have been much higher. That is, it. I mean, I said I didn't want to be seen in certain places, but yeah. with, with the in the age of everybody having a camera, you would have had to say either I'm going to be out or I'm going to be totally closeted. You could not have. I mean, what I tried to do in the early 80s was sort of live half in and half out. Publicly, I was sort of ambiguous. Privately, I would socialize with other gay people. And uh, I could not have done that in the age of the, of the cell phone camera and the internet. Was it taking a toll on your um, psyche, your on, behavior? On my, your on my personality. Personality. On, yeah. on my judgment. Uh, I got involved in an inappropriate way, Chip, because I was looking to satisfy physical and emotional needs that I couldn't do. Um, I, I was unhappy and uh, it, it, it interfered with my work because I was, uh, you know, legislating is very interpersonal and you would, uh, you need to, and particularly, you're going to be an effective legislator. You have to have a great capacity to reveal the fact that you think someone is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or even worse, someone who isn't stupid but is saying stupid things at a, at a given moment. And um, I, my capacity to do that was, was limited because I was so unhappy. I know, and I, you may have read, I've heard this argument, oh, well, generally about closeted people. You know, oh, yeah, she doesn't have much of a private life, but, but she has such a, a good career that, that that's the substitute for the private life. That is not only wrong, it's, it's absolutely the opposite of the truth. It is not, no, the best career in the world is no substitute for the kind of emotional and physical needs that, that most of us have, almost everybody. And beyond that, I found that there was a great disparity between a career which was prospering and which was bringing me great credit and then going home alone at night. So that there was a, you know, the, the, there was always that, uh, an old song, Saturday night is the loneliest night in the week. The contrast between the gaiety and the, you know, the socializing and then, and then the loneliness and that just got to me. 
I'm sure it was not great also that, that hearing that it's coincided with you know, Reagan being in the White House and probably feeling like there wasn't a lot that was getting done. Um, actually, all right, so on the subject of government then um, and governing, um, the other part, the other seismic shift in the book about the, the, the lack of the decline in faith in government. And one of the things that I think that you were arguing in the book was that, that the Democrats, uh, you know, uh, had a, a lot of it was their fault because they weren't any longer uh, um, delivering for average working stiffs, right, blue collar. I, I agree, but it wasn't our fault that we weren't delivering, but we weren't doing enough to counter that. Okay. Um, and that uh, now you're saying, I think, one of the arguments you make toward the end was that uh, faith in government can be restored at least somewhat if uh, we make some choices, if we deliver, we have, if we put the money toward it, if we put the money toward yeah. delivering. And one of the things that you mentioned in there was, well, that's one way to doing that, getting the money would be cutting the defense budget, cutting the military budget. Now we have, in the last two weeks, as you probably know, we have two uh, budgets, the House said, the Republican House budget and the Republican Senate budget, and the only thing they, they differ on some things, but one of the things they're united on is increasing the military budget. So, I mean, is, uh, you know, is it basically checkmate on, on this for no, the it, it foreseeable is, future? As long as the Republicans are in power, but I think the public is more on our side. I mean, uh, and I said, I don't blame the Democrats. I, what we have is this dilemma for Democrats, and I think it hurts the country, where white men in particular working class men, people who don't have any particularly advanced skill set, people who are willing to work in, in basic things, they have become increasingly alienated from uh, the Democrats. And at first the argument was, well, why are they voting against their interest? And there was like Thomas Frank's book, What's the Matter from Kansas, with Kansas? The first argument was, well, that's because of the social issues. They're doing that because of any gay rights, because of guns, because God, guns, and gays. I don't think that was accurate. Uh, look, the fact is that support for gay rights has gone across this country, across various ethnic and, 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 and social classes, while government's still plunging. Guns is part of the problem, but I think it's more profound than that. There are people who are philosophically opposed to government. Don't worry about them, I can't win them over. Our problem are people who have traditionally been the kind of people who believe in government, who voted for FDR and Harry Truman and, and, and Johnson and Kennedy, and Here's the problem. They really do think government can do a lot. And their anger is that as their economic position has eroded, as the economy has shifted, the government hasn't done anything. And uh, in fact, they see the government responding to other groups. That's where some of this comes in. But it's not that there are any black or any women or any gay. It is, oh, they care about everybody but us. And I think the problem is that, in fact, this is true. As we have seen more and more prosperity, there has been an erosion in the economic position of the guys who used to work at the steel mills and the auto plants, and they're angry about that. And here's the frustrating thing to me. Because they're angry uh, at government not doing things, they vote for people who are angry at government in general. So the angrier they get, the more they vote for people who are going to frustrate us, and the less that will happen. As far as the Democrats are concerned, look, we've only, and people forget this, since Ronald Reagan became president, there have only been four years out of that 35 when the Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Clinton's first two years and Obama's first two years. Well, we did some things, including under Clinton, making the tax code better, et cetera. But what happens here, and this is also frustrating, we're the party of government in people's minds. So we get blamed even when the Republicans do bad things. For example, one of the things you'll hear from the Republicans, oh, you Democrats and your bailouts. You've heard the denunciation of bailouts. There were five bailouts in that 2008-2009 period. Every single one of them was initiated by George W. Bush. Every single one. Two of them he started and finished. Three, the Democratic Congress helped. But we could blame people to all those bailouts. All, that's what the Democrats did. So I think to break the cycle, we, we need to show these people that government can, in fact, produce for them. But the frustration is you don't have the money to do it right now. And so the only way to do that is if we could get a substantial reduction in the military budget, you could then make it possible for working class kids to go to the state colleges, not just the community colleges, pretty cheap the way they used to be able to. You could put more construction workers to work doing things that the society needs. You could pick up more of the health care. And, and you could do things that genuinely help people. Um, and I think they would then 
feel better about government. So, uh, you know, the question is, how do you restore faith in government? I'm not a great theologian. I think there is some kind of uh, distinction between faith and works. In this case, I, it, it's got to be works. That is, we can't talk people into liking the government, but if the federal government had $50 billion to spend suddenly on these kind of programs, I believe you could do that in ways that would begin to make people happy. And also, you do that at the state and local level, uh, and the way you do that at the state and local level is to uh, acknowledge that the war on drugs has been a costly failure, and you stop putting people in prison because of the recreational use of drugs. <laughs> Saving an awful lot of money. And I believe, that because the thing is, it's particular parts of government are popular. The mistake is people say, oh, well, I'm against government, but I like Medicare, I like the veterans. Affairs. <laughs> what we have to say is, look, this is government, and we're gonna, you, the government's gonna make it easier for your kid to go to college. The government's gonna put more construction people to work. The government is gonna uh, provide more of the, of the health care. We're gonna pay a bigger share of it, so you, your money will go further. There are some other things we should do. I think uh, liberals, I am critical. I think liberals forgot how important unions were. And uh, there is no question that the, the erosion of the power of unions is one of the reasons why the economic position of working people has fallen. Uh, all right, so here's, here's an interesting, this, this feeds into some of what you were saying. Today happens to be the five-year anniversary of the signing of Obamacare. And um, if you look, I was, well, I, was reading a, I was reading a couple pieces today who were, that were listing all the things that are happening with Obamacare, uh, sort of dashing all the dire predictions that have been rolled out over the years, although the Republicans still refer to it as a train wreck anyway. Um, but what's so interesting, so you've got 16 million people, you know, if you include the Medicaid that are getting it that didn't have it before. But yet, when you look at the polls, and how do you explain this, um, the polls still show very tepid support. If you're going to say, do you support it or do you not support it, it's like, it's still like, you know, maybe 42% support, even though it is yielding all these benefits. What do you, what do you think explains that? Because obviously Democrats are like, huh? Part of it is uh, the fact that when we were doing it, the perception was, and this was what killed Clinton's plan, that we were going to extend health care to the people who don't have it without putting in more government money, so it was going to come to the expense of people who had it. That wasn't an accurate perception, but it was easy for them to demagogue it because, well, where's the money coming from? Beyond that, I think it was making progress, and we were coming back, and I think people underestimate the serious hit Democrats took, Obamacare took, by that ridiculously botched rollout. I do not understand why the president was not one full day a week saying, nothing is more important, show me what's going on. I, I am very unforgiving of the incompetence by which that was done. And then having to follow up by saying, oh, by the way, when we said if you like the health care, you can keep it, that was a lie. Um, it, it wasn't necessary to say. In fact, look, one of the things that Tea Party guys say is, well, you tell us if we shut down the government, we're gonna get hurt. But we shut down the government a couple years ago and we won. Yeah, they won because w they were hurting after shutting down the government. Right. And then came this rollout. I think people forget. And, and I think if you go back and look at the polls, you'll see it went back down and it's climbing uh, back up again. Even with that, the Republicans are, uh, as you notice, they, they are very critical of it, but they really aren't serious about undoing it. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to see this, obviously. But the silver lining in the cloud that it will be if they take over the House, the Senate, the presidency is to see how they get themselves off the hook. They put themselves on the health care bill because there is too much in there that's too popular with people for them to repeal the whole thing. And if you start doing it piecemeal, well, it all fits together. And I don't know what they're going to do. Right. Well, they've been talking about putting together uh, some kind of replacement bill for the last two Which years. Which we, we haven't seen. seen. Never right. see anything. Um, and you got to support this Supreme Court case, of course, coming up. And that, by the way, which is kind of nutty, that case. I think politically, I mean, the Democratic position is, hey, if I'm in a state where X number of people lost it, let's, let's have our own exchange. I think that's a problem for the Republican governors who have a set of exchanges and for the Republicans. And they say to Obama, what's your fix? Well, my fix is put those words back in the bill. I think they are going to reap some, some, some serious problems if that happens. You know, the, um, one of the, another thing, that, and this happened during Obamacare, at least at the beginning. You know, you have a lot of interest groups activist groups um, that wanted a lot more 
you know, from Obamacare than they got. And that obviously is the case with so many things you worked on over the years. And you have a lot of stuff in the book about how difficult it can be, how much more difficult it can be to work with friends, you know, than it is to deal with enemies. So you have these, you know, groups on the left that, that make demands and they want a lot more than it can be achieved and you're all about the politics, the art of the possible, right? So you have this line in the book, and I set up the question, where you talk about how activists um, have a tendency, this is a quote, uh, uh, to choose emotional gratification over tangible, albeit insufficient, uh, progress. Uh, if you tell your supporters that nothing has gotten better and that any concessions are just tokenism, uh, you take away their incentive to stay mobilized. Um, so my question actually is, how, worry, how worried should we be about, you know, we're in this sort of much more polarized world now where, where activist groups really actually are even less tolerant about compromise than they used to because, you know, everybody's sort of filtering their information only to their own side. Uh, obviously, you've seen it get worse in the time yeah. you were in Washington. Let me begin. I, I forgot one thing before. And you're right in terms of the military issue. was not going this way now. That's the one thing I want to press the president to do. I believe the American people, in fact, are tired of these interventions. They know Iraq was a terrible mistake. They do not want to stay indefinitely in Afghanistan and Iraq and go into Syria and go into Yemen. And uh, in fact, the Republicans acknowledge that because they don't like the president's legislation to authorize, in effect, bombing the Islamic State butchers. But he says limited, no ground troops. They don't like that. It's too limited. So they say, oh, we can't pass anything. Well, they could pass something if they wanted to. They know what they are for, what John McCain and Lindsey Graham want to do, this constant intervention, is unpopular. The president's gone part of the way on Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the biggest issue now for me is he should not give in and send the troops back in. If he got up and announced, you know what, we have worked very hard for this, but there is no military solution to the problems of societies that cannot get together. There's no military solution to corruption, to a lack of respect for each other, for religious differences, and for all that internecine warfare, and therefore, we are withdrawing our troops. We did what we could, and we are not going back in. We have a military initiative. Our military is very good at stopping bad things from happening, so we've done that somewhat. But we can't make good things happen in a different society. And my argument to the conservatives, by the way, is these are the people who think we can't do anything about poverty in America, but it is, on the other hand, we're going to Iraq and, and put that fractured society together. I think if the president did that, he would have enormous support and you, would, including, by the way, in some of the Tea Party people, Rand Paul and some others. So I, I think that is that, 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 that people are ignoring the American people are ready to do some sensible reallocation. And what the other point, though, you're absolutely right, and you got it at the end. We now live in parallel media universes. There's Fox and the talk shows, and then there's uh, the Huffington Post and MSNBC. And here's the problem with it. The most active people tend to think that their views are the majority because those are the only people, everybody they talk to says that. I, <laughs> people said to me in 2009 and 10, let's have single payer. I'm right. for single payer, but we don't have the votes. What do you mean we don't have the votes? Everybody I know is for single payer. <laughs> and, 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 and people live in these reinforcing echo chambers. And then they become angry when you compromise because they think you're not compromising out of necessity to get the best you can, but you are, you are, you are cowardly. And uh, there was no question. And here's the last part of it. And it's even worse here on, on, with some of my friends on the left. Now, the right is obviously more extreme in this, but here's the part of about the left I don't like. When people on the left, and it has to do with the passage you read, when they are dissatisfied with the particular output of government in a, in a case, they don't say, isn't it too bad that these right-wingers blocked us from doing more? They say, oh, the goddamn government doesn't work. Um, they, they are too quick. They join in. Uh, you know, there's terrible voter suppression on the part of Republicans passing laws that make it hard for people to vote. You have to have, you know, a lot of 80-year-olds who were born in Mississippi who were black don't have birth certificates. They weren't given them. Uh, but we have leftist voter suppression of an intellectual sort. If you tell people they're all bums, they only listen to big money, none of them are any good, nothing good ever happens, I think it's one of the reasons why people don't vote. So what I want people to do is, yeah, it's, that's an inadequate bill, but don't condemn government as, as, as being inherently unable to do it. Say that's an inadequate bill because the current balance of forces is unfavorable and we get to go to people out to vote. And I contrast Occupy and the Tea Party. 
Obviously, I agree a lot with Occupy, by no means entirely, and there's the Tea Party. You know, the difference is the Tea Party got out and registered their people and voted in primaries, and Occupy had big rallies outdoors and, and had, in the end, very little positive impact, and I regret that. But, uh, you know, when, when the, basically, when the right gets mad, they vote. When the left gets mad, they march. Voting beats marching in America. <laughs> I do, re I do remember there was one incident in 2010, I actually wrote about this at the time, where you were at a, one of those town hall meetings. There were town hall meetings, a lot of Tea Party people were showing Dartmouth, up. Massachusetts. In Massachusetts this was, and uh, somebody came out and was talking about Obamacare, or, or that Obama was uh, sort of uh, uh, advocating Hitler type Hitler, policy. Yeah, he had a picture of Obama with the Hitler mustache. Yeah, and, and you said to the woman, this is almost an exact quote, you said, uh, you know, madam, arguing with you is like arguing with a dining room table, and I'm not going to do it. And, <laughs> I tried. True. I tried, and uh, I did say before that, she said, why are you supporting these Nazi policies of Obamacare? And I said, first I want to say that the fact, I'm very proud to live in a country where you can make those outrageous remarks. And I, wanted, as I said, everybody should say, that's, that's what free speech is about. Free speech is about letting someone say these terrible things. And she persisted. And that's when I said, I, I argue with you would be like arguing with a dining room table. Fox News then ran my response without showing what she had said and thought, and thought that I was very rude and it was very unfair. And that was at a point I, had, I tend to gain weight on distress, so I was at my heaviest. And, but what bothered me was shortly after I did that, they began to lionize Chris Christie for speaking back. And I said that they apparently they had a double standard for rude fat guys. <laughs> um. Well, I got one last question before we go to, uh, uh, to everybody in the audience. Well, some of you in the audience. Um, just looking ahead, uh, circling back to what we started with in some ways, um, U.S. Supreme Court is supposed to make a ruling on uh, gay marriage in probably June, June probably the, the last day or two yeah, of, the, of the session. Of the session. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I'm certain they're going to uh, say yes for two reasons. First of all, uh, Justice Kennedy, who's a swing vote, has been a leader in, there have been three major opinions vindicating the rights of LGBT people to be treated equally. There was the Colorado case when they said you cannot uh, pass a state law that forbids a city to do something only for gay people. If you want to say that no city can pass any discrimination law, it's one thing, but it can't be only for gay people. Then he wrote the opinion in the case that overturned the sodomy conviction of two guys in, in Texas. And then, of course, he wrote the Doma case. Uh, it's inconceivable to me that he would turn it around. But even more, there's a sort of a technical thing lawyers will understand. A number of the federal courts of appeal, well, in fact, most of the federal courts of appeal, only one voted against same-sex marriage. I think five or six were in favor of it. But and including a lot of uh, Bush, Bush, Bush appointed judges. Right. Um, but um, when a number of circuit courts ordered states to have marriage, including Pennsylvania. And uh, some of the states appealed. Interesting that the governor of Pennsylvania, the then governor, didn't because he knew how popular it had become and he didn't want to fight it. Um, but uh, what, what you then had a situation where they went to the Supreme Court and said, please don't let them get married in the interim. And the Supreme Court said, no, I'm not, we're not going to put that decision in limbo, which means the Supreme Court is now allowing people to get married pending the decision to have allowed people to get married in what would then be an interim period and then say no more marriage would be very unwise judicial discretion. I do not believe it would have made any sense for them to refuse to put these marriages on hold if they did not intend to let them go forward. Mm -hmm. because you, otherwise, you would have a situation in many states where there were some gay and lesbian couples who had been able to get married in this window and others who didn't, and no one could think that's a good idea. So we're talking like maybe 14th Amendment, equal protection of the laws I mean, kind it, of ruling. Yeah, yeah. And there'll be, there's one, one, I mean, there, there'll be two reasons to be very happy about that, I believe. One will be to get the right for everybody to get married, and, and maybe some good legal doctrine beyond that. The other will be the joy of watching Antonin Scalia go absolutely nuts in his, <laughs> <laughs> in his bitter, vitriolic, homophobic <laughs> diet fried. <laughs> And, and uh, Ted Cruz announced his candidacy today, so who knows how he'd respond. 
All right, we're going to go to questions, and um, um, I, I can call on some. You can call no, on some. You, you know how to do this, right? Oh, and please, folks, obviously, uh, in the form of a question, not speech. One of the buzzwords of political discourse today is income inequality. What do you see as the causes of it, and what do you see as ways of combating it? The cause is primarily the shift in the world economy, particularly as it affects the United States. That is, we have had much more, and I've been reading Thomas Piketty's book, um, given the way trade works, Americans have been able to sell to the rest of the world high-end products, products made by people with, with highly developed skills and advanced degrees. For a variety of reasons, we have not been able to sell as much to the world or even to ourselves in the face of competition, sort of basic manufacturing. And I think that's the fundamental shift that, that, that has happened. It's been exacerbated by some public policies. Uh, the right has been very helpful, very successful in beating unions. One thing that's relevant is, you know, the old federalism idea, that's become a problem. Quick, quick example that brings the two of them together. The United Auto Workers, uh, Volkswagen has a plant in Tennessee. The United Auto Workers said, we want to organize it. Volkswagen said, good idea, because we like unions. We worked them in Germany. So they were about to have an election, which you have to have. And Senator Robert Corker, who's a supposed mainstream conservative, not a Tea Party guy from Tennessee, on behalf of the Tennessee Republican Party, says to the union and to the company, you know that grant we were going to give you to expand the company with public funds? If you have a union, we're not going to give it to you. You will not be able to expand. And as a result of that, a narrow majority voted against it. It was an offer they couldn't refuse worthy of the mafia. And somebody said to Corker, well, what do you care? The company's okay. The union's okay. He said, here's the problem. If we have a union at Volkswagen, that'll push up the wages. And if wages go up in Volkswagen, that will exert upward pressure on wages elsewhere in Tennessee. And if wages go up in Tennessee, we will lose our ability to get companies to move from other states because of our low wages. So there's a conscious element there. It's the fundamental economic shift, but they work on it. And the answer is, well, first of all, you support unions. But beyond that, you, and, and, and Obama and Clinton both have done some of that with the tax system, but you take public money and provide aid to people who are not doing well so that you, you make college tuition, not just community college. You know, I'm sure there were people here who went to the state colleges very much, pretty cheap, 100 bucks, a couple hundred bucks. Restore that. Now, obviously, that would benefit the wealthy and the working class guy, but it would be irrelevant to the wealthy. Uh, put more construction people back to work using public funds to, to, to employ them. Pick up a larger part of people's health care uh, so you can reduce, uh, reduce premiums. In addition to increasing taxes at the upper end, knock a percent or two off the Social Security tax, which is, you know, if you make $90,000, uh, a married couple each making $90,000 pays more in dollars in Social Security tax than an unmarried person making $300,000 because of the way it works. Um, longer term, you educate people better. Shorter term, you do, you do minimum wage. Um, it's a combination of factors that I think uh, w w w would be helpful. On the left side, somebody over, over here. I think there's someone right there. Hi, help me understand. Uh, President Obama has said that he's uh, for um, an, a non-nuclear uh, world. Uh, but then he is now embarked on expanding our nuclear military capacity by a trillion dollars. Why is he doing this? Very good question. First, I, I should say, I, I was skeptical when he said there's going to be a non-nuclear world. I don't think human beings can unlearn what they know. So I never believed that. Um, but I do believe we should be going the other direction. Some of what he is doing, he made a deal that I thought was a bad deal. I understood why he did it. In 2010, with the Democrats about to lose control in the post-election period, there had been a nuclear treaty signed with Russia. And uh, they were trying to get it ratified. And the price of getting it ratified was to agree to a demand led by Senator John Kyle that they modernize our nuclear arsenal. The fact, I agree with you, our nuclear arsenal, we still have the capacity to destroy the Soviet Union. 
uh, not Russia, the old Soviet Union, uh, it, with three different forms of delivery. We can do it by intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear-armed submarines with their one missile goes off and 16 of them go hit somebody, and the, and the airplanes. I have a serious proposal that I make to the Pentagon. People think I'm kidding. The th and by the way, I, obviously, Putin has turned out to be a very bad guy. Um, uh, but he does not have the power of the Soviet Union. I mean, I'm very, I mean, I'm once again glad my grandparents got the hell out of there. But <laughs> he's not a threat to the United States the way the old Soviet Union was. It's a, uh, and, and we have more than enough capacity to deal with it. Uh, Obama, first of all, made that deal. And secondly, and this, as I said, is a big issue. His instincts are good. He's, he wants to get out of Afghanistan and Iraq. But they go to him, you're the president, you must maintain security. I, it's the one thing I wish he would do was to say, no, we, we are plenty strong enough and we don't have to keep doing it. Um, you, know, you know the largest air force in the world is the U.S. Air Force. Does anyone know what the second largest air force in the world is? It's the U.S. Navy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, aircraft. And on the assumption that they are not planning to go to war, we could probably reduce the size of one or the other. <laughs> but I, I want to say to the Pentagon, and I agree, look, I'm critical. Of, of, I think he's giving in to pressure that he should not, and I think the American public is more willing to stand up for this. There's a cultural lag on his part. I want to say to the Pentagon, you have three ways of destroying the Soviet Union in an almost nuclear war. Pick two. <laughs> Give up one, save about $10 billion a year. So I, 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 I regret that he's doing that. I think he's giving in to pressure, and I think it's a, it's a mistaken view that the public is insisting on that. I think the public is far less insistent than he was. Here's, here's what it will. Where we are. We didn't have much of a military before 1940. And then we had to build up to defeat Hitler. And then after Hitler, we had a terrible man, Stalin, very heavily armed. So, yeah, that was an existential threat to America. When communism collapsed, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton both said, you know what? Nobody threatens us anymore. There's bad people out there, but nobody's a threat to America's existence. So they both started reducing the military budget. And then Dick Cheney and his allies very cleverly used 9-11 and made it into the equivalent of the threat from the Nazis and the communists. It is not. Of course, they're terrible people, and I'm happy when many of them get killed. But they are not a threat to the existence of the United States. I mean, I wish nuclear submarines could defeat terrorists, because they don't have any, and we have a lot, and it would be over. But <laughs> <laughs> what happened was there was a period when people got persuaded that, that, that we had to fight terrorists with the same level of military that we have for the Soviet Union, the public now understands that. The, the fact that Iraq was such a disaster. And I think the president is not fully aware of that. I think the public is ready to say, yeah, fool me once, that's enough. And I think he could substantially reduce it, and there was no need to do any significant upgrading of the military. One of the things they're worried about are the intercontinental ballistics missiles and people are sleeping on the job. We don't need intercontinental ballistic missiles. We have the airplanes, we have the submarines, that's plenty. I think there's what behind you. I think there's some people. First of all, no one has said this, but I want to so much thank you for all your service to us and to our country. And we all love you. you. We're all in this room love you. Uh, uh, there, there's some, there is a question I have about the, what I consider to be the elephant in the rule, room that you haven't talked about, and that's money and politics. And that seems to, for a lot of us, depress us a lot. That we uh, that it seems to be so pervasive, and of course the Supreme Court cases have have just made exploded the amount of money, mostly conservative money in politics. So it becomes right. harder to have the view that you can actually accomplish something or do something in light of all that money. So you've been there. What's your view on that? First of all, please don't say that. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let me give you some example. Let me quote Elizabeth Warren, who you will see on the back of the book, she is one of the people who says nice things about my book. <laughs> in 2009, when the committee I chaired, and we had the big money back then too, in 2009, the committee I chaired passed the bill to create an independent Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And Elizabeth said, very emotionally, after the meeting, we had an informal talk to the press, they told me not even to try this because the banks always win but they didn't win today. Let me give another example, net neutrality. Most of the big money was terribly opposed to net neutrality. The Wall Street Journal has an article today about how it was one of the worst conspiracies in the world. 
Net neutrality won because the average citizen spoke out. Look, money is very dominant, but votes will beat money if we can mobilize them. Um, votes beat money in the financial reform bill. Not, by the way, in health care, because in health care, the providers quite sensibly like that. That was not, you know, uh, us versus the money. So, yeah, it's a problem, and uh, it makes the job harder. It makes the presidency all the more important. Look, the worst decision, the Citizens United decision, which said uh, corporations are people, um, that was five to four. Now, ordinarily, when the Supreme Court decides a case, the doctrine of stare decisis, let the decision stand, comes in. You don't want instability in society. You don't want things always changing. But some things are not firm. A five to four decision that controversial has no weight behind it. If Hillary Clinton is the president, gets to a point during her time replacements for any of the five conservative justices, two of whom are 80 or older, then we'll have that overturned. Uh, so the presidential election is very important in, in that regard. So yeah, we've got to fight against it. Um, but uh, it, it, it's not hopeless. It makes the odds harder, so we just got to keep trying. Congressman Pittman. Oh, right, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, so if a question was asked to you about gun safety in America, and somebody said, what can be done going forward? What can be done to move the needle? What would be a reasonable approach from your perspective? I'm pessimistic on that one. Here's the problem. And by the way, the NRA doesn't win because of contributions. And I wish every liberal organization would study the NRA and try to be like them. They are a very effective mobilizer of their political strengths. They get all their people to register to vote and know who their legislators are and write to us. And I, 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 the problem is this. Most of the people in this audience think gun safety is important and we should enhance it. But most of the people in this audience care about a lot of other things, global warming, economic fairness, et cetera. The NRA has the advantage that they have members who care only about that. And it is the concentration of their energy there that does it. So I wish that I could think of a better strategy. Um, we've tried all kinds of things. You've seen what happens. You have these terrible massacres, and they don't want to change it. Colorado adopted a tough gun law, and they had a special election, and a couple of those senators got defeated. Now, they came back, but uh, the way the political system works, you have this, uh, the, you know, if, 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 if you are willing to forego any input on any other issue and focus only on one issue, you can have an outsized impact on that. And I, I do not foresee there being people on the gun safety side who are going to emulate that. Yes, ma'am. Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that members of Congress have a real Rolls-Royce health care plan, and that even if you serve for a very short amount of time, you have health care for life. Is, I think that's correct. No, it isn't. Okay, then what is the correct I have a suggestion. Hmm? I have a suggestion. Be careful what you read on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trouble with the Internet, no. The health care that members of Congress have is exactly the same as any other federal employee. When I was in Congress, I had the federal employee's benefit plan, the same as any other federal employee, the same as an IRS agent. Um, there was no special health care plan for members of Congress. That's Internet nonsense. And uh, I'm not in Congress anymore, but I used to show people my blue cross card. And it, literally, it's the federal employee's health plan. Uh, as far as having it for life, no, you have to have served a minimum amount of time. Uh, to be in the pension plan, and then if you're in the pension plan, you can get health care. You pay for it, by the way. It's, it's not free, and uh, it is exactly the same as any other federal employee. So, you know, the, now, the federal government gets a good deal because there are three million federal employees, but you don't, members of Congress don't get anything other than uh, uh, the person who works in the Social Security office. Because there's somebody back, there's some way back there, a couple of people. Thank you. I've got a question for you about gerrymandering. Uh, you've spoken about the importance of getting out to getting people to go out and vote for their 
uh, political beliefs, but in the state of Pennsylvania, every Republican vote for Congress counts yep. twice as much as a Democratic vote due to uh, gerrymandering, if you do the math. What, if anything, can we do about this in view of the fact that it's the legislatures who get themselves elected yeah. who decide on districts? One is to, uh, but of course it's self-fulfilling, is to try and take back the legislature. Um, what you can do, the next, it, it will come up again in uh, 2021, when they have to redo the census. I mean, they will have to redo it after 2020, and if you had a Democratic governor then or a Democrat in any one place, you can stop it. One of the bad things that may be happening in the Supreme Court is the obstacle to another way to do it. In some states, they have begun, California for one, to have referenda that create redistricting commissions. They did in California. There is a successful effort to put that on the ballot in Arizona, but the Arizona legislature has gone to the Supreme Court because the Constitution says that the uh, manner of electing members of Congress, this is only for Congress, is, good, is up to the state legislatures. And reading that literally, there's nothing you can do to get around that. You can't have a referendum. You could for your state legislators. So that would be an indirect way to do it. Um, but uh, the only way to do it is to uh, either try and take over one house of the legislature, well, actually it's too late to do that between now and 2021. Be very careful about the uh, gubernatorial election that's gonna leave people in place in, uh, what did you just have one in 14? So the gubernatorial election of 18 will be very, very influential in deciding that. Um, you know, look, facts are facts, unfortunately. Well, here's the problem we had. 2010 was a great Republican year, and it happened to be the worst year for it to be a great Republican year. 2006 and 2008 were great Democratic years. If either one of them had been in 2010, we wouldn't have had this. But there we are. Yeah, over there behind you. Hi. I, could you tell me all these years later, what are your feelings about NAFTA? Oh, I think it was a mistake. I think it was one of the reasons that contributed to the... Uh, erosion of working people and um, it should have had safeguards in there for uh, labor and environment. Now President Obama is talking about that but I still, my view on trade is this. Trade is good for America as a whole but it still has negative distributional effects within America uh, because Americans they sell more at the high end and, and import more at the lower end. The business community very much wants trade President Obama says he will include safeguards for, so that they can't have lower in labor and environmental standards, and I believe he's right about that. But I think it's time for us to say to the business community, look, you want trade? Good. Stop fighting unions. Support fairer taxation. Support better unemployment compensation. In other words, I would say, let's make a deal. Trade will benefit the business community and upper income people more than others. Let's, in return, do some things as part of the package that will help people who are at the lower end of the scale. And I would ask the president to hold off on trade until he gets that deal. Thank you. What, um, what is your take on Netanyahu's visit to Congress <laughs> and his, uh, his speech trying to persuade the Congress well, not to support the president's uh, Let me put it this way. If I had been there, I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was outrageous. Soundbite. And it was bad for Israel. And somebody asked me today, do you think the Democrats will still be friendly at Israel? I said yes to Israel, but not to Netanyahu. And I think Netanyahu is doing great damage to Israel's cause. Um, by the speech about not having a uh, Palestinian state and a very unconvincing, oh, I didn't really mean it. Um, he's given the Palestinians a great out. I think there has been a problem. I think the Palestinians were given offers by Bill Clinton and uh, by Ehud Barak, by Ehud Olmert, um, and they didn't have the courage to take a realistic deal. But now, the next time a Palestinian might be offered a reasonable deal and says, no, they blame Netanyahu, and, 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 and that'll be plausible to people. Uh, he made this mistake of aligning himself with the Republican Party. And I say it's a mistake because I have always told people, don't worry about support for Israel. I used to go to AIPAC, and I did it again this year, and talk about the liberal case for Israel. 
but there's a lot to be said for it. In the history of the United States, three heads of state have spoken favorably of gay rights from the uh, podium of the House of Representatives. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Benjamin Netanyahu. In Israel, on a liberal scale, they still have. Uh, I mean, one of the things I like, they're, they're a state that's been under attack, and they do better on civil liberties than almost any place else. But this decision to align himself with the Republicans and the saying, I'm not going to have a Palestinian state, are terrible mistakes. He has a right to say what he wants done in Iran, but deliberately insulting the president and, and basically signaling that he prefers the Republicans, it's going to have uh, consequences. So I think the appropriate Democratic response is to say, you know what, we, we are still very strong supporters of Israel's right to exist as a free, democratic Jewish state with security. And the way to do that is to make clear that we think Netanyahu is not pursuing that in the appropriate way. And if people said, well, well how can you tell him? Well, he, he has certainly forfeited any right to complain about Americans com talking about his politics. No, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, two-way street. Then the last question, of course, is Iran, and here's the deal. I am afraid that the critics of our deal, and that includes Prime Minister Netanyahu, have as their agenda war with Iran. Nobody can seriously argue that he said, I don't want this, I, I'm not against the deal, I want a better deal. And I believe John Kerry and the president are trying to get the best deal they can. Um, but I also believe that they don't think, they, they're trying to get the Iranians to do more than I think is possible. I think the deal significantly slows them down and gives us a chance to react. And this is a question, I think, do you want, or you want to go to war against Iran or not? I think it would be an even worse mistake than the Iraq war. That doesn't mean you ignore them. Look, I wish we didn't have nuclear weapons, but nuclear deterrence did work. Uh, the main obstacle to the Iranians using nuclear weapons, if they get it, is America's retaliation. I don't want that to be the case. And in fact, I think the deal we're getting is some indication by them that they understand that. And, and the sanctions are working. Uh, but I believe that it is the view of Netanyahu and John McCain and others that uh, Iran is so bad and so destabilizing and so untrustworthy that, that, that we really have to go to war against them to destroy their capacity to build a nuclear weapon, which, short of occupying the whole country, you couldn't do anyway. Is there anybody way in the back on either side that hasn't had a... Mr. Frank, do you think we're doing enough to stop ISIS? Yes. Um, I think the air war has been very effective. You know, remember when they were going to take over that town, Kobani or whatever it was? And I think the air war has been very effective. And I don't know what else to do. I think sending American ground troops in would be a great mistake. Um, you know, we sent them into Syria. Whose side are they fighting on? What we've got, I think, is an effective ground force together that's opposing ISIS. And I think our, our uh, air power is, is very important. And I would say this, if the local forces opposed to them, the Iraqi army, the Shia militia, the Iranians, the uh, non-ISIS Syrians, if they can't beat ISIS with American air power, ISIS has got no air force, with that great advantage, then the only alternative is for America to go in and occupy. I mean, that's the dilemma. If, if they can't slow down ISIS now, then, then, only, it's, then, then America has to take over the war, and I think that would be a mistake. And I also don't think it's necessary. Um, I think that they, uh, they, they have been thrown back, and I think uh, here's the deal. You can't destroy them from the air, but you can certainly keep them from taking over any significant amount and holding territory. Then they become, they become uh, targets. So I think the air war has been very effective and, and should be kept up. And, and the alternative is American ground troops going to war there, and I think that'd be a big mistake. Anyone way back there? Yeah. Welcome to Philly, Barney. Um, I'm curious about your, your take on Hillary. Uh, I would do that. What do you think, or what's your take on Hillary um, winning the primary uh, given this big flap over the cell phone business. The what business? Or oh, the cell phone? Emails. I don't think many people care. Um, here's the deal. If anything comes out from those emails that was embarrassing, then she will be hurt. And should be for being stupid enough to put something embarrassing in an email. Um, but um, 
I don't think the American public really cares with all the issues they have which server somebody used. I think that is very much inside politics. Um, and I'm very much a supporter of Hillary. I know there's some, for some reason, I have friends on the left. It's almost like, you know, look, we're on the left. We can't really be satisfied because that's not appropriate for us. We have to be kind of, <laughs> if we're not being insurgents, then we must not be doing our job. Go back and read Paul Krugman's columns in 2008 when he very clearly showed that Hillary was the Barack Obama's left on domestic issues, not on foreign policy, and that troubles me a whole lot. I think she's pulled back there. Um, I think she's, and the other reason why I don't want to see any kind of opposition, you didn't ask for this, goes back to that question before. We are going to have a financial problem. I don't want to waste any money in the primaries. And people say, oh, wouldn't it be good to have a primary? Yeah, tell it to Mitt Romney when he <laughs> got through with that collection. Uh, of, of people. And you can say, well, can't you have a primary that doesn't get uh, vicious? No, the media won't let you. The media will egg each other on and will say, she said this and he said that, and it will get nasty. So, uh, but I also, I, I do not believe the email situation. Uh, and, and here's, they don't think so either. I was watching Meet the Press a week ago yesterday. Because I was getting ready to go on. That's what I was watching. And <laughs> Trey Gowdy, <laughs> Trey Gowdy is the Republican counsel from South Carolina who's investigating her for Benghazi. And Chuck Todd, the moderator, said, you know, this is the fifth investigation of Benghazi. <laughs> what are you going to find out? He said, well, in the first place, we have a couple of witnesses other people haven't talked to. But even if we don't find anything new out, corroborating what we already know will be valuable. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a man who thinks he's got anything. Um. I have to apologize to anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question because we're just about out of time. But thank you for your questions. Um, I'm going to ask one last question to send us out of here. This is from the last uh, paragraph, the last chapter of the book. Uh, you say, um, looking back, uh, I think I was pretty good at my job. Uh, now it is time uh, to be good at life. So I'm wondering, looking ahead, uh, what are your goals for being good at life? Well, first to... Uh Survive the book tour. <laughs> <laughs> like tonight. It's to enjoy myself, uh, spend time with Jim, um, to get involved in issues of my choosing, you know, in my terms, and uh, be able to speak out, but uh, not be stressed. And basically it is not to do anything I don't want to do. I guess that's the basic uh, the basic. Uh, <laughs> well, he's here because he wants to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate it.